Thank you. Um, so this talk is going to be more down to earth about stem cells and regeneration. So aging is often depicted as shown here by Edvard Munch as a relentless progression from a wondrous child to a full grown uh, woman to middle age and then aging, uh, decrepit aging. And we know that um, our longevity is increasing. Both men are living longer and women are living longer. Um, but the quality of life, the health span, is not increasing. So as posed in nature this year, we have more years of what? Um, years spent with chronic disease. So the goal of regenerative medicine is to change that and to increase the health span, the quality of life, so that you can enjoy life and run and ski and do all the things you love to do even when you're aged. So more specifically, the goals of stem cell and tissue engineering are to regenerate or replace damaged or diseased tissues. For instance, for the treatment of Parkinson's or myocardial infarction, heart attack, stroke, uh, to use cells to deliver genes that are missing in inherited diseases like muscular dystrophy or hemophilia, and to identify deleterious stem cells, cancer stem cells, uh, that lead to malignancy. And finally, to understand early human development, to model development, to model disease processes, and to test for drugs in culture. And there are basically three types of stem cells that I would like to introduce you to, embryonic, induced pluripotent stem cells, and adult tissue-specific stem cells, each with its relative advantages and disadvantages. So stem cells really began with embryonic stem cells. As we know, the embryo can become anything, the cells of the embryo. So the oocyte is fertilized and it divides, and you get to a blastula stage where there's an inner cell mass, and if you isolate those cells and put them in culture, you have embryonic stem cells. And those stem cells can be directed to differentiate into any cell type of your body, skeletal muscle, a cardiomyocyte, skin cells, and you can study those cells, and you can use them, in theory, for uh, treating disease. There are advantages to embryonic stem cells. They extensively divide, and they provide an almost unlimited cell source. And they can be di differentiated, in theory, into almost any cell type. The disadvantages are that you're dissociating the inner cell mass, which involves destruction of the embryo created by in vitro fertilization, and there are ethical concerns regarding egg donors. Also, it's not as easy as it sounds to direct the cell to become a mature cell type. These cells in culture usually express fetal genes, not adult genes, and there is a risk of tumor genicity, gen uh, forming tumors, as they are often unstable karyotypically. So, uh, we came into this field, or I came into this field, wanting to know about other cell types and how plastic they are, and could they be induced to change and form new kinds of cell types. So the question I asked is, is the destiny of a skin or a liver cell terminal, or is it reversible? Can it be changed? And the dogma at the time in the 80s was that if you were a liver cell or a skin cell, that was your destiny. It was fixed. So I devised a cell fusion system called a heterocarion, where we fused multiple muscle cells from mouse with human liver cells or human hepatocytes to form this mixed species, non-dividing syncytial cell. And in this environment, uh, there was no loss of chromosomes, no loss of genetic material because everything remained stably in its place. And what we showed was the liver cell could be induced to express muscle genes that it normally never would. And we showed that for a number of different human differentiated cell types. And we could determine that it was the human genes because they were distinct from mouse. So this showed that there was no chromosome loss or rearrangement and that reprogramming could activate silent genes in mammalian cells and that this was possible and that the differentiated state was not fixed and irreversible, but instead there was remarkable plasticity that could be enlisted 
in differentiated cells in mammals. Others were also approaching this, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to Nicole Durin, who is here, and who showed the pluripotency of cells from the brain using a very elegant chick quail uh, method of following and monitoring quail cells transplanted into chickens and determining their plasticity in response to their microenvironment. And this was taken to another level by Shinya Yamanaka in 2006, who developed the second type of stem cell that I want to describe, which are the induced pluripotent stem cells. And uh, as you've heard, these are useful for modeling disease in a dish, screening for drugs, and using them for cell therapy. So what Yamanaka did was he identified four factors, transcription factors, that if overexpressed in cells taken from your blood or your skin, would turn them into pluripotent cells with features and potential just like an embryonic stem cell. They could uh, divide uh, unlimited, become immortal in a sense. And they could also be differentiated as shown on the platters below. You could make them into cardiomyocytes, heart cells, or endothelial cells of the vasculature, or neurons, or uh, skeletal myoblasts. Or you could genetically engineer them and correct a gene. And the advantages shown on the bottom are that you have an unlimited source of these cells, just like embryonic stem cells. They are matched. They can be, in theory, matched to the person from whom they were taken. It's a non-invasive procedure to take your blood or even a little bit of skin. And there would be no immune mismatch, whereas with embryonic stem cells, they're from a different donor, and you would need to be immunosuppressed throughout life to have cells from that source. Also, of course, bypasses the use and destruction of embryos and uh, allows one to study uh, disease mechanisms in addition perform drug screening. And in theory, also provides a means or a, a source of cells for tissue replacement. Um, the disadvantages are that these cells, like embryonic stem cells, are difficult to differentiate beyond the fetal stage of gene expression. They also do have a tendency, because they're immortal, to be tumorigenic. And we still have a ways to go before we can safely use them uh, in people. Um, in addition to which, the, the uh, difficulties in scaling up and making quality control cells uh, at a reasonable cost is immense. And so right now, uh, autologous cells, which would overcome this immune mismatch, are not envisioned, and people are focusing on cell banks uh, that are non-autologous. So I want to give you an idea what disease in a dish means. So we took cells from the blood of, of people and converted them to pluripotent cells. And here you see them differentiated into cardiomyocytes, heart cells. And we did that by uh, first introducing the four Yamanaka factors and then differentiating these cells with a cocktail of factors. You'll hear about some from Eddie de Robertis, Wintz, and retinoic acid, a uh, series of factors that can convert them into these beating heart cells, cardiomyocytes. And we made them by printing uh, extracellular matrix proteins in an aligned fashion, you can see in that center cell how you nicely can get the cell to uh, organize and look at its contractile apparatus. And in this way, you can monitor whether it has contractile defects, uh, similar to arrhythmias, for instance. And taking that further, what we've done, and you see a beating cell up in the uh, upper right, and it's now on a hydrogel with fluorescent beads. You can see the green fluorescent beads that are around it. And uh, you can look at the contraction in terms of the displacement of the beads by traction force microscopy. And you see by these Fourier transforms how you can monitor the contractile activity. And you can see how aberrant it is when you have uh, genetic defects in contractile proteins. So this kind of modeling disease in a dish allowed us to determine, first in human cardiac tissues looking at the cardiomyocytes, that the telomeres are, these are the protective caps on the ends of chromosomes that shorten with aging, that you get premature shortening of those telomeres in the nuclei of individuals who have uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, heart failure due to the absence of dystrophin or troponin 
or tighten. Structural proteins essential to contraction. And we were able, taking IPS cells, these induced pluripotent cells from patients' blood, we made them into pluripotent cells, and then we made them into cardiomyocytes. The pluripotent cells had normal telomere lengths, and as they differentiated into cardiomyocytes, within 10 days, we saw the shortening. So you can recapitulate 30 years in 30 days in a dish, and that's what we mean by disease modeling. And now you can look at interventions, because these cells also exhibit a DNA damage response, mitochondrial failure, reactive oxygen species, and stress. And you can look for screen for drugs, because you can plate these cardiomyocytes in thousands of little wells, and screen for drugs that will correct the defects. And this is the type of thing you could not do easily in mouse models. So this is a very um, potent platform for drug discovery. But the most advances in terms of therapies using stem cells have come from adult tissue-specific stem cells. That's the third type. And these are stem cells that are present in your tissues, like your muscle or your skin or your blood, and they're dedicated to replacing uh, those tissues. And they're envisioned for ex vivo therapy and also um, drugs that can stimulate the cells, the stem cells that are present in your body uh, to function better. And I'll give you some examples. Perhaps the most uh, dramatic and useful are the uh, hematopoietic stem cells, where it was proven that the hematopoietic stem cell was isolated by specific markers using a mouse that expressed green fluorescent protein in all of the cells of its body. If you isolated the cells with these markers through a cell sorter, you can see this one little GFP positive cell glowing green. You transplant that into an irradiated mouse where you've depleted the bone marrow, and you reconstitute every cell of the blood. And this type of procedure is being used in humans and is used to uh, replace blood af after um, irradiation and chemotherapy, for instance, for malignancies like lymphoma and leukemia. Another example, corneal stem cells. Um, if your cornea becomes opaque, you lose vision. And tremendous strides have been made now with adult stem cells again, cells taken from the cornea of uh, a person whose uh, cornea has become somewhat opaque. You take them from the limbal area that is neighboring the cornea, and a little piece, a little biopsy of one to two millimeters can be cultured enough to comprise enough cells for two eyes and restore vision in a person. So this is a tremendous advance. Um, another area of retinal pigment epithelial cells are also being uh, cultured in the same way with the view to treating macular degeneration, especially the dry form, which is 90% of macular degeneration that also is associated with loss of vision. This is not quite as advanced as the corneal transplants, but it's coming along. And I think it has tremendous promise. In this case, it's using your own stem cells, culturing them to make more, and replacing the defective cells that have arisen with aging. And another example is in uh, the skin area, epidermal uh, stem cells. In this case, this concerns uh, a genetic blistering disease called epidermolysis bullosa, EBD. It's due to the absence of a structural protein, either laminins or collagens, uh, that are crucial to the function of the skin. And when missing, when one of these proteins is missing, you get a blistering and erosions, and it's very debilitating. Children usually die from it. It's a rare heritable disease due to the absence of these proteins. And they can't play, they can't, uh, they get infections, they get scars, they blister every time they're touched. And uh, tremendous strides were made just recently in the last year um, by De Luca here in Italy, in Modena, Mod Modena in Italy where they took skin from a boy who was born in Germany and who they were just going to put on painkillers, a uh, seven-year-old who had never been really out of hospital, and they took the cells and they cultured the true stem cell and engineered it to express the missing protein, a laminin, and then transplanted that, and 80% of the boy's body is now covered with new skin. 
and he's functioning so well, I've heard he's actually playing soccer. So, and these cells in three years, it's three years since they did this transplant, uh, there have been 30 cycles of self-renewal. And this is evidence that they really found the true stem cell, which is one of the major challenges in the adult stem cell field. That is, finding the stem cell that doesn't immediately specialize, but can self-renew, make more copies of itself, as well as specialize. And the fact that this has persisted for three years shows that they, they found the key stem cell that had been uh, missed in many labs worldwide opening up a whole new uh, avenue. In my own lab, I've been focused on muscle stem cells. 40% of the body mass is muscle, and as you age, your muscles become weaker and smaller, and that compromises your quality of life as you become weaker and less mobile. And in the muscle, as you see depicted up there, there are muscle stem cells. They're called satellite cells, and they're in little compartments along a muscle fiber. There's one glowing pink up there because it expresses the hallmark transcription factor, PAC7. And when there's injury, these cells that are quiescent are activated, and they now divide, and they become committed progenitors, and they fuse into the muscle fibers to restore the muscle uh, strength. So we were interested in ways to uh, stimulate those uh, stem cells to perform better. And I want to just give you one example of something that we found recently, which is a different approach. Rather than taking stem cells out of the body, treating them and putting them back, what we want to do is target the stem cells that are present in your body to function better and restore muscle function. So we reasoned that what happens immediately after an injury is a wave of inflammation, as shown in orange, and that something in that wave of inflammation might really um, stimulate the stem cells. So we did an in silico screen, a bioinformatics screen, of activated stem cells analyzing all the transcriptome, the RNAs that are made, and we identified EP4, a receptor, on the surface of the stem cell that was induced when there's injury. And EP4 is the receptor for prostaglandin E2. So we then looked at damaged muscles, uh, and we found that, lo and behold, after damage, you see a spike in prostaglandin E2 in the tissue, just as is uh, at the same time course as the inflammatory wave. And we isolated the muscle stem cells with markers we'd identified by cell sorting, and we plated them in culture, we exposed them just transiently. We reasoned that just a transient short-term exposure should suffice. And we did that for 24 hours. And a week later, we saw a massive increase in muscle stem cell numbers. So we wanted to know how it works. And what happens here, you see time-lapse microscopy. And you can follow the stem cells as they're dividing. On the left are the controls that did not see prostaglandin E2, and on the right are prostaglandin E2 treated cells. And you can see that the ones that were treated with prostaglandin E2 are dividing faster and much more extensively. In addition to which, we find that prostaglandin E2 is protecting the cells from cell death, as you see in the lower right. So faster divisions, more divisions, and uh, protection from cell death. To see if they really could help with function, we treated the mice, uh, aged mice, um, doing a normal kind of uh, injury, which is downhill running on a treadmill for 10 minutes a day. We treated them each day with a, an injection, intramuscular injection of prostaglandin E2. And then a month later, we looked at their strength. And they had a twofold increase in strength, which is really substantial for muscles both twitch force and titanic force. So we're capitalizing on a natural regenerative response to rejuvenate muscle stem cell function and increase strength in the aged. And we're hoping to translate this to people for a number of incidences of muscle atrophy. So just to recapitulate, there are three types of cell sources for regenerative medicine, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent cells, and then these tissue-specific stem cells, uh, each with its uh, relative advantages. Um, and I think that right now, the biggest strides in terms of therapy have been with the adult stem cells, but people are working hard to improve the quality of the others to bring them up to standard 
um, and overcome the uh, tumorigenicity issues. And I'd like to close with this. Of course, it would be different, entirely different, he says, coming out of Congress, if we could extract crude oil from stem cells. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>